you know, I, I saw recently, just in the last couple of days, a, um, oh, it was a discussion. I think it was, oh, it was on Rational Wiki, which is a lot of BS there from what I've seen. <laughs> but still, I like to see, okay, what, what, what is somebody saying now who is setting themselves out as a proponent, you know, of the accepted orthodoxy? This is, this is it. So basically, it, it comes back to the idea, which has been around for a long time, among those who do, for example, grant to the flood myths this idea that there could be a literal or a historical event behind them. Of course, what it always does is becomes a regional event. Oh, there was this really bad flood in the Tigris or Euphrates River, and somehow that became this myth that, that you know, the whole world was destroyed and, you know, Utnapishtim or, or whoever it might have been in that particular myth built an ark, brought the, the, the animals on. This was seen as the precursor to the Noah story. Then, of course, you, you, you find that these flood myths are all over the world, right? So how do you explain that? I mean, so how do the, the, the reductionists explain that? When I say the reductionists, I mean those who are, you know, basically purveyors of the, of the orthodoxy, which is that these were just regional events. Well, it's interesting that when you read the details of, of these regional events, and then you have this amazing correlation, you know, where you have Native American traditions where there's a great flood, and the survivors do so because they built a great canoe, and the term is the, a great canoe. Okay, well, then the standard explanation would be, oh, well, they heard that from missionaries, and then they grafted that into their into their religious tradition. And like, you know, look, certain things are just so transparently BS that even without the documentation, you can still recognize that it's BS. But when you start looking at some of the early explorers and, and people particularly like George Caitlin, uh, who, you know, he was the Indian artist. He wrote the book, Last Rambles Among the, um, oh, I forget the exact name, Last Rambles, I think. And then it was subtitled, you know, amongst all the, the American Native American tribes. And interestingly, he visited over a period of whatever decades, like a hundred different tribes reported the same thing. He said, and, I, and I'll pull up this quote at some point because it's such a great quote. And it comes right at the end of, of his book, which was about what he learned about the cultures of the native peoples in, in North America and Central America. And he said, well, there's a whole diversity of traditions and languages and beliefs and stuff. But there is one thing that is consistent among every tribe he visited. And that was their belief that they were descended from ancestors who survived a great catastrophe that wiped out everybody else, basically. Right? So you see parallels in the so-called new world and you see in the old world. And the explanation that it was a diffusion process that the missionaries came over, told these stories. The native peoples were so impressed by it that they said, hey, let's, let's modify our religion to, you know, graft this in because it's, it's so interesting. No, what happened when they came over and told those stories, the native people said, well, we have those stories already. You see, yeah, we know those stories. Our cultural ancestor was so-and-so, Manny Bozo or whoever it might have been that survived the great flood. So the thing is, is now we have to look at it. And, and, and here's, I think, the, the perspective. You have the, on the one end of that, you have the, the, the skeptics, the reductionists who basically try to explain it away by saying, oh, it was just, you know, it, it, it was, you know, in the whatever, in the Tigris Euphrates Valley, there was a big flood one year, bigger than normal, you know, 4,000 or 5,000 or 6,000 years ago. And now they're still telling the stories about it. It became, you know, um, exaggerated, exaggerated into this, you know, much, much bigger thing through the retelling because it kept getting told and retold and retold. Each time it got retold, it got bigger. It got more impressive, right? Until it finally came the whole world, right? But really, originally, it was just a bad flood that, you know, flooded the Euphrates Valley, but had nothing to do with somebody living up in Europe or in Asia or North or South America, right? Well, the thing is, though, and then on the other end, on the other end of the spectrum, you've got the evangelical Christians who don't need any scientific explanation. 
who've accepted in toto the, the, the model of the universal flood. And all it requires is just the supernatural intervention of the Lord God Almighty. It doesn't require any scientific explanation behind it. It's just there. It's a universal flood. It, the waters rise and drown the entire world, even up to the highest mountains. And I've tried to understand where they explain the water came from and where it went eventually. And there's where we get kind of fuzzy. And then we get into some serious fuzzy logic there. But um, so that's kind of what, that's it. That, you know, those are the two models we, we, we were given, right? So, okay, we can accept this. We can, we can take the fundamentalist model and, and, you know, we don't need, it's just, it's supernatural. It's God's, you know, miracle. He can do whatever he wants, right? On the other end, it's just a regional flood. The reality is that there have been hydrological events that can only be measured in the hundreds of millions of cubic feet per second. Now, when you're talking about a hydrological event that is on that scale, you're talking about, let's, let, let's just cite an example in some of the uh, sites that we're going to visit on the Scablands tour. For example, there's a place called, um, help me with this, Brad, there, uh, just below Potholes Cataract, the, uh, the nine, ten-mile-wide tract of... Oh, Drumheller Channels. Thank you, thank you. Drumheller Channels. There's a place there called Drumheller Channels. It's where a sheet of water came down over the Columbia Basalt Plateau, and it spilled over a rim. There was, there was a change in gradient, right? So, you know, gradient affects the velocity. The, the erosional capacity of moving water is a function of the velocity. So, obviously, if it's a slower-moving stream, it's not going to be erosive, right? As, this, as the gradient increases, the velocity increases, the erosive potential increases. Right there, there's this, this rim, slightly a tilt in the, in the basalt. So you go from a shallower pitch to a greater pitch, right? Well, right at that spot, you had a stream of water that was about 400 feet deep and 10 miles wide. And as it's starting to spill over that rim, it's moving now probably on the sl slower gradient, 40 to 50 miles an hour. Once it hits that rim and starts going to steeper gradient, it's probably now going 60 to 80 miles an hour. And then you can see this entire plexus, the Drumheller channels, where it begins to, to sweep away the landscape. Hundreds of feet of the landscape just gets swept away, right? What's left is called the Butin Basin topography, where, you know, if you've got a landscape, let's say in this case, it's basalt bedrock. Within that basalt bedrock, there are lots of fractures, fissures, weak zones of weakness. This flowing water is going to exploit those zones of weakness first. So you got this basalt bedrock there that will be, you know, pretty planar, P-L-A-N-A-R, planar. You've got a fracture. So the water begins to exploit that fracture and it begins to erode. And that fracture literally turns into a canyon. Now, maybe a half a mile away, you got another fracture and the water is eroding that as well. Now, what will happen is, is the water eats away the sides. And this is water that's loaded with abrasive sediment. It's gushing along at 50 or 60 miles an hour. So, I mean, it's stripping. It's stripping big time. So, it's enlarging the channels. Now, you got a channel here. you got a channel over here. As it's enlarging, what's happening? The, the area in between... Which, which the technical term is interfluve, in between the fluvial, the flow, right? Interfluve is getting eroded away. Now, let's suppose that the spigots get turned off. The source of water is, for this flood is, is depleted. Well, now what happens is wherever the, whatever stage of erosion that landscape is at, it now becomes a frozen landscape. It becomes an extinct landscape, right? The great floods sweep away, they, they, they rip stuff up, and then as the water eventually, wherever it is in its pathway to the ocean, it begins to slow down. It now drops, it deposits that sediment. So what you're going to see when you follow the path of a great flood like this is a succession of areas where it's been eroded, and then that will be followed by an area where that material has been deposited. Okay, so now here's what I'm getting at. 10 miles wide, 400 feet deep. Well. 
That's just in this one pathway. When you look at the whole area of Basalt Plateau, there was a temporary submergence of almost the entire plateau, right? So now anybody living in that plateau, and there would, there, and there certainly, I think, were. I mean, I think we can conclude um, that there were people living there, that from what we know now about the Clovis inhabitation of North America, right? But there would have been nobody living there afterwards. Unless, of course, somebody's in a place, let's say you're over there um, in, in just outside of Missoula, Montana. Now, just there in Missoula, Montana, there's the Missoula Basin. And if you're standing there in the town of Missoula on the campus of the, uh, the University of Montana there, there are two mountains, Mount Sentinel and Mount Jumbo. After Jumbo named after an elephant because it apparently its back reminded somebody of a big elephant. Well, if you're standing there on the floor of the, of the Missoula Basin, on the university campus there, and you're looking up on the sides of these two mountains, you see etched, horizontal etch lines, right? Those are called strand lines in geological nomenclature. They're basically extinct beaches. Now, a beach, maybe you would think of something that, 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 that's produced over a long term. I would argue that what we're seeing there are simply lines that represent the, the declining, the pauses in the declining and the draining away of the flood water. But the point is, is the highest one is a thousand feet above your head, right? Now, go a thousand feet up, that means that the water was up that level. So it, whatever, whoever was occupying, whatever animals or whatever people was occupying the Missoula Basin, and it, it, the evidence is that it was a, a, a what you would call a boreal forest. That means spruce trees, alder trees, larch trees, poplars, right? Probably loaded with game, probably got cold, right? But it was probably still a pretty good place to live. I mean, in, in another, whatever, 50 miles north, you had the, the, term, the Flathead Lobe Terminus where Flathead Lake is, you know, and that would have been regularly seasonal melting. So there'd been rivers coming down. There were probably, those rivers were probably loaded with fish. Anyways, you're living in this valley. Now suddenly one day you hear this rumbling and you don't know what it is. And then the ground starts shaking. And the next thing you know is four, five, six hundred foot wall of water comes washing into the basin. Well, if you're down on that floor, you're history, you're gone. But let's say you were up on the top of Mount Jumbo or Mount Sentinel because the water didn't reach the top. It's probably another couple hundred feet of mountain up above that highest strand line, right? Let's suppose that by the luck of the draw, whatever, you're up there one day, you're, you're hunting or something, you're up on the top, all of this happens, you take shelter. Now let's forget all the other possibilities that might be going on, like the atmosphere might be on fire and there might be crap raining down out of the heavens, whatever. But let's say you manage to take shelter. After all of this is over, a week, two weeks, three weeks later, you come out, and what's left of your world? Not a damn thing. Not a damn thing. As far as the eye can see, in every direction is devastation. You come out, you and a small band of survivors, you spend days, even weeks, walking, right? Because that's all you got, you know, um, and nothing but devastation. So now your traditions are basically that the world was destroyed. But 50 miles away, there's another group of survivors who are seeing exactly the same kind of a thing and assuming because they, you don't know, you have no way of knowing what's going on 50 miles away, unless you, you know, walk there basically. So in a sense, what we're saying is that we now can scientifically demonstrate that there are floods, not that universally drown the whole planet, but can destroy a world. That's my point. And we're finding more and more evidence globally that these kinds of floods have occurred. And believe me, we are going to get into that. We're going to get into breaking that. We're going to analyze the myths, and then we're going to look at the science for all these mecha various mechanisms by which worlds are destroyed, right? Whether it's by flood or it's by fire. And interestingly, when we go back to the Younger Dryas, we see both of these factors converging. We see flood and we see fire on a massive scale, massive scale, unimaginably. And, and just as we've, we're learning, the, the you know, 50% of the great megafauna didn't survive. We also begin to see evidence, and I haven't gotten into all of it, but I mean, evidence continues to emerge that 
there was also a human population bottleneck. Maybe not leaving the kind of genetic signature that we would look for if we want to say, okay, if the entire human population was reduced to a few tens of thousands of people, right? However, if these people are scattered about the planet, yeah, we shouldn't necessarily look for that genetic uh, similarity. You know, if you have survivors of the Altai Mountain flood, you know, living in what is now Mongolia, right? You've got a group there, and then you've got a group over in 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 uh, North America or South America. That's the point: is you might have a pretty broad diversity of survivors in these various isolated groups. But I think that begins to really fit this model that we were we've been looking at: the dis- disappearance of the Clovis culture and the 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 who, who had left their 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 layer of artifacts, you know, in the landscape. Clearly, uh, 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 a, a signature of their presence there for two to three to four hundred years. What's interesting about that is they show up; they're suddenly there. They're they're quarrying their stone to make their very unique spear points. They've got their campsites. They're leaving their evidence in seventy sites around back up fifty some sites around unglaciated North America, and then. Right along at the right at the window with the megafauna gone, they disappear. But there's a difference, and this to me is a, 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 a question that needs to be looked into, which is this: we find the remains of the mastodon, we find remains of mammothus columbi, mammothus primigenius, we find the remains of Arctosimus, of Ursus spalius, of Camelops, of Castoroides. All of these magnificent beasts, the dire wolves, right? We find their remains. Where are the remains of the Clovis? I mean, the Anzic girl, teenage girl, is that the only one? I don't know. Uh, to me, that's something that that's needs a- to be probed into. Where are the remains of the, where are the actual skeletal remains or mortal remains of the Clovis people? Yeah. That question haunts me for sure. Yeah. Kyle, we're counting on you to come up with something, man. <laughs> yeah. I also I also wanted to point out when you're talking about the flow of water and its erosive qualities, you know, 400 feet deep at the bottom of that is, I mean, it's going to be a, a couple of hundred PSI, right? So you got... Oh, yeah. What's the, what's the water pressure at 400 feet deep? Well, it's... Like 180 to 190? Oh, probably in that range like because... That. Yeah. Yeah. Probably in that range, yeah. So that's, yeah, 200 pounds per square inch. Yes, and then the shear forces right, from that yeah. water, yeah, I mean, are going to be inconceivable. And then, of right. course, when you actually see the drum hill or channels and you have this picture in your mind, you go, oh, I'm starting to get it now. Right. Yeah. So I do have a, I, I don't know, th- this could be part of the reason why we haven't found any Clovis skeletons, but I mean, uh, a lot of sites, like if you find remains, you know, you have to turn that over to the Bureau of Ethnology and then they get to decide whether there's actual DNA testing done on it or whatever, or they may want to rebury the body. So it's possible that there could have been multiple yep. excavations of skeletons that just never were tested. So we couldn't confirm whether or not they were Clovis people. What if you find a dude? What's the rules on that? Like, what if you're hosing down, you find a dude? Have you found a dude? If I did, I would never admit it. Is Are there it, rules if you find a dude? It's archaeology is different. They can shut the f- down right now. Oh. Oh yeah, that's why a building project, and you know, you stumble across something. Yeah. New York City doesn't matter. L.A. You're done. You're done until there's been a proper excavation and documentation. What if you find a whole village? Oh boy. Oh boy. Yeah. So you've already found tools. So you've found evidence of humans. We don't have to talk any further about this. <laughs> Look at the logo on your hat. I get the logo. I get it. I get it. I get it. Wow. Well, you of course, that's possible? there was would have been, if there were skeletons found, I, I think we could safely assume that there was there would have been some that were found before implementation of the Native American Graves oh. and Repatriation Act. 
That's a good point. Um, which I think is eighties. Um, but, but if that's the case, where are these? Are there, are they in the vaults and museums down in the sub basement? I don't know. Yeah. They got Smithsonian. Yeah. They've been Smithsonian. They just disappear. They've been Smithsonian, Smithsonian eyes. It's it's a verb. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Smithsonian. (laughs) And I mean, eighties, when were we able to do genetic testing? You know, that NACPRA shows up in the eighties, but that's Right. right around when we started to be able to. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Well, I am of the mind that anything that's nine or 10 or 11 or 12,000 years old really is the heritage of all mankind. Yeah. I, I really do. I, I mean, I, you know, I totally respect Native American traditions. I do. Yet I've heard some Native Americans themselves say, yeah, we're interested in what this shows. We're interested in the science. So if there's not a, you know, again, everything gets politicized, you know, but in this case, what we would learn is so damn important. You know, the lessons like, because that question, what happened to the, what happened to the Clovis people? We know that the Kennewick right. man was post Clovis, right? Yet the Kennewick man was found in very late stage flood sediments along the Columbia river right there near Wallula gap. And I know I haven't, followed the, the the controversy lately but you know there was a long time where um there was a lot of controversy yeah. and there was a movement to prevent the dna testing and the right. age testing of of the kennewick man well you know that the the, the terrace that the um that the kennewick man was found on who know you know there was there might have been more but Shortly after the find, the Corps of Engineers went in and dumped like hundreds, if not thousands of tons of rubble on the site. Yeah. You know, supposedly to protect the site. Well, I mean, right. what? That's like, yeah, you just, des- you destroy the village to save it. Yeah. You know, there's a pretty extensive and very interesting article on the, on the Kennewick man at smithsonian.com. Very well done. I, I recommend anybody look it up. Um, that okay. describes the whole process from discovery all the way to the very end and how they had to fight back and forth on, you know, whether they would be able to do any testing on it or any studies at all. And they eventually got 24 hours. Yeah. Only 24 hours. And after that, the whole thing was reburied and covered in concrete and just. Yeah, that's uh, insanity. And that's political, political correctness gone insane. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, anything that old, I mean, I, I'm sorry, it's the common heritage of mankind. And I think it would be wonderful if we could demonstrate that there was a lineage between somebody 10 or 11 or 12,000 years old and modern tribes. I think that would be wonderful. But, you know, I mean, the, the, the genetic evidence is going to show that it was or that it wasn't. So yeah. if it was, great, that's awesome. You know, you guys have got ancestors. We can now demonstrably prove that you've got these ancestors that go back thousands and thousands of years. And if not, well, then who are, who are these people, you know? And if, and if not, then that certainly does put it in the realm of mankind's common heritage because 10,000 years, that's a hell of a long time. And let's see, yeah. 10,000 years, we could say that that is oh, about 400 generations. Yeah, that's if we assume 25 years for a generation. So a lot can happen over 400 generations. Yeah. I want to read this part from the um, the Wikipedia on, on Anzic 1, just to okay. clarify sure. what I'm yeah. saying. So Let's do. It says Anzic 1's discovery and subsequent analysis has been controversial. The remains were found on private land, so the researchers did not violate the Native American Graves Protection and Rape Repatriation Act mm. in their study. But many Native American tribal members in Montana believe they should have been consulted before the researchers undertook analysis of the infant's skeleton genome and genome. So, mm. so they didn't break the rules. So, yeah. So, okay. Well, it would have been fine to consult them, but I mean, to what would end? there have been a would there have been a Kinnick, you know Kennewick man fight over that? That's yeah. what. Yeah, I mean, that would be my first question. And then you maybe know. we wouldn't know if it was, you know, so I don't, it's, it's. And I think those, those kind of policies 
are you know they always have the the, the wrong effect. Yeah, like they're detrimental. You, to, right, you do something like yeah. take the Kennewick man, and then no one that's, wants that's to tell the you doctrine of unintended consequences. Exactly. Then people yeah. are going to hide it from you in the future, and then you don't get what you want. Uh, yeah. So in you know, on private land, if somebody were to discover some remains, it'd be like, pff, pff, just cover it up. And just don't, yeah. Don't, don't tell say anybody, yeah. and then we don't know anything about yeah, it. Yeah. So right. It, it has a detrimental effect. And it's my opinion that those events and what the effect they would have had upon the uh, the native inhabitants of North America at that time are so critically important, you know, such a critically important part of our human past on Earth. We need to know, we need to understand what happened. And, you know, we've, we've come a long way in the last few decades, but we still don't really know what happened. 